coming from Luke, the 11th chapter. <clears throat> the, the 37th through the 46th verses. So again, that is Luke, the 11th chapter, 37 through 46. And it reads, and as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Then the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean. But your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But rather give alms of such things as you have. Then indeed all things are clean to you. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by ju justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen and the men who walk over them and are not aware of them. Then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things you reproach us also. And he said, Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And so on tonight, to go along with that scripture, my subject or title will be, Let's Be Real, Who Do People Say You Are Versus Who You Actually Are? So before we get... To our text for tonight, I just want to go back to the previous scripture of Luke, the 11th chapter. So if you want to turn there, it's that chapter before Luke 11, 33 through 36. Before Jesus was invited to the Pharisees' home, he had just finished teaching on the subject of the light within. So it, it just fills my heart tonight that everything that we talked about in prayer is right in line with what God gave me to speak tonight. And so it says, and I believe that this was a fitting teaching just before he accepted the invite to dinner with these Pharisees. And in these verses, Jesus says that it would be foolish to light a lamp and then hide it, but it should be placed on a stand in order to be seen by all who enter the house. Furthermore, he proceeds to use the eye to convey the message of the lamp. He says that your eye is a lamp that provides light to your body. And so when it's good, your body is filled with light. But when it is bad, your body is filled with darkness. So what we should take away from this is your eye represents your spiritual understanding and insight. So let's examine our natural eyes because this will give us an understanding of just how important it is to keep our spiritual eyes healthy and how important the light is. So during that time of study, I noticed that there was a long detailed description. However, we're just going to go over the Cliff Notes version for illustration purposes. And so the following is a listing of how your eye actually works. With each step, I will expound to show how it relates to our spiritual eyes. So light is reflected from an object. Jesus is the light. So when we look to him, he comes into our vision before when we were slaves to sin, we could only see everything else around us. And Jesus was just a blur in the distance. But now that we've been introduced to him, all other things have become that blur to us. While he is in our vision and he is clear to us. Now the next step is that light enters the eye. The light pierces the eye. And how does this relate to your spiritual eye? Well, Jesus pierces our spiritual eye because we have welcomed him in. There are many who are lost because they have chosen to shut Jesus out. So think about it. When you don't want to let light in, what do you do? You close your eyes. Some have closed their spiritual eyes to Jesus, but others who have let him in have opened their eyes and are ready to receive the light. So next, your eyes get focused. And there are times when we first open our physical eyes from waking up and there must be an adjustment. And this is known as focus. And just as our physical eyes have to adjust to the light and focus, so do our spiritual eyes. So we'll no longer see things the way that we used to see them. We'll have a completely different outlook on situations in our lives. And so next, the light is converted into signals and information is delivered to the brain. So as with most functions of the body, signals must be created and sent to our brains in order for it to process what our bodies must do next. Our brain receives the information in mere seconds and it doesn't delay processing any bodily functions. 
And so realize that when you accept Jesus as your life, you begin to study. You begin to receive word from your ministry and you receive revelation from God. And this is all information that is sent to your brain so that in turn your spiritual functions are not delayed, but are being processed in God's timing. And lastly, the information is seen as an image, and this is the end result. So once your eye processes the light, you'll see an image. And this may be the most important part of why it's necessary to keep your spiritual eyes healthy. You want to see Jesus, and the way that you see him is through the manifestation of his work in your life. This is the reason that we talk about the fruits of the Spirit so much, because there has to be evidence, and those images are just that. So evil desires can make the eyes less sensitive and block the light of Christ's presence. The Pharisees wanted to appear as though their light was shining because of their outward actions. However, they failed to realize that the light must shine from within. It could not, though, because they had evil desires that were blocking that light. And just as Jesus challenged the crowd, we should be challenged as well to think if we have a hard time seeing God at work in our lives, then we need to check our vision. So ask yourself, are there any sinful desires that are blinding you to Christ? So in our text for this evening, we'll see that the, the Pharisees definitely had issues with being blind and in most areas. But importantly, being blind to Christ, who was right there with them. And we'll learn that Jesus strongly criticized the Pharisees and the experts in religious law because of the following. And there are four points. They washed their outsides, but not their insides. They remembered to give a tenth of their garden herbs, but neglected justice. They loved praise and attention, and they loaded people down with burdensome religious demands. Now, the first point, they washed their outsides, but not their insides. This will cover verses 37 through 41. The 37 through 38 reads, And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Now, here we have another story where the Pharisees have decided to make another appearance. And come to think of it, the more that we talk about them and we study about Christ's life, life, the more that we can associate the Pharisees to modern day celebrities. You know, it seems like they're always in the know of what the next big meeting is going to be. They know the exact time, the exact place, and the exact people who are going to be there. And they didn't have social media or technology back then, but they always made sure that they weren't tardy for the party. And it was as though they had just, they just had to be in the mix because they believed nothing could go down without them being there, whether it was for show or they felt like they needed to drop their words or thoughts or comments into the setting, or as we like to call it, their two cents. And so in these beginning verses, we find that a Pharisee invited Jesus to dine with him. So we just talked about how they thought they were the cool kids on the playground or that cool crowd in the cafeteria. So you know that there had to be more than just a few friends of the Pharisee invited there as well. The Pharisees were always up to something. Remember in the message last week, we discussed how they constantly tried to hem Jesus up with all of these questions about religion, Moses' law, and the traditions. You would have thought it was like a philosophy class, the way that they threw question after question after Jesus. They were bitter and fought so hard to trip him up. But Jesus didn't mind at all because if you recall, they were often rebuked by Jesus and called out for who they really were. So remember, the Pharisees were mostly middle class businessmen who were in contact with many of the common men. They controlled most of the decision making because they had the support of the people. And they accepted the written word. And at the time of Christ's ministry, that meant that that was the Old Testament teachings. But their downfall was that they gave equal authority to tradition. They added them to God's word and they put on the appearance of obeying the traditions, but expected for everyone else to obey as well. So again, we are not to treat traditions as having equal authority to scripture. And we are not to allow our relationship with God to be reduced to a list of rules and rituals. So in relation to our title tonight, Jesus consistently asked the Pharisees during his ministry, let's keep it real. Who do people say you are versus who you actually are? And so also apply this to yourself. Who do people say you are versus who you really are? So in the second part of the verse, we learned that Jesus came in and made himself at home. He came in, he lounged in the dinner area and proceeded to eat. And so you can imagine that there was a, a collective gasp in the room, coupled with the hand over the chest move. You know that hand over the chest. Well, I never. The utter disgust that must have come across some people's faces, along with the whispers of, did he really just do that? 
So surely he knows that it's customary to wash before attending dinner. And the next verse, verse 38, proves exactly what I just said, because there probably was silence in the room. The Pharisees sat in awe of what they deemed a blatant disrespect for a customary tradition. But of course, here again, we have the Pharisees making a mountain out of a molehill. And you all know what that means. That just means when a person makes too much of a minor issue. So do you know some people like that? Because there are some ministries right now where people can't get their breakthrough or deliverance because the leadership is so concerned about everything being perfect. But God don't care about none of that, y'all. And yes, I said it. God don't care about none of that. We can strive for perfection. And yes, we can strive for excellence because that's what God wants. But most importantly, he's impressed with the spirit of freedom, not restriction with these rules and regulations, these traditions, these bylaws and these program outlines. The pitiful thing is that some people are so tied up in a certain order of service that they may just lose their mind if one part of the program falls out of line. So what if the pastor decides to conduct offering at the beginning of service? Because you should constantly be in prayer with God anyway about what he would have you to give. So why should we necessarily wait to the end for you to put that $2 or that $20 or $200 in the basket because you already knew what you were going to do? So what if the praise team and worship lasts for 30 minutes or even an hour? So you're mad because you feel like the praise team is acting like they on Sunday best. But in the meantime, you should be excited and jumping and shouting with the other saints just because you finished partying last night or a couple of hours ago and God didn't snatch your very soul. So what if the altar call turns into more than just prayer and becomes a deliverance service? While you're in your seat with your nose turned up and lips pulled out because service is just taking way too long today, you are the very one that should have run to the altar and been on your face asking God for forgiveness so he can break your chains. And even beyond that, so what if pastor doesn't even get to his message? Depending on your maturity, you may only look at it as a feel-good message anyway. Or be the loudest person saying amen because you think it has everything to do with Sister Betty, but actually God is trying to cut on your stone-cold heart. But I'm going to get off of that and get back to the message because somebody might stop listening to my message because their feelings got hurt. So the hand washing ceremony was not done for health reasons, but as a symbol of washing away any contamination from touching anything unclean. The act was for consecration purposes and was directed towards the priests. So not only did the Pharisees make a public show of their washing, but they also commanded that everyone else do it as well. And in the Old Testament, it was very important for the people and especially the priests to cleanse themselves. In Exodus 19 and 10, it states, Then the Lord told Moses, Go down and prepare the people for my arrival. Consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothing. Be sure that they are ready on the third day, for on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai as all the people watch. And Moses was told to consecrate the people, and this meant getting not only physically ready, but spiritually ready as well to meet God. The people were to, be set to, were to set themselves apart from sin and even ordinary daily routine in order to dedicate themselves to God. Now I'm going to put a pin right there because I want everybody to understand that they just said that they need to set themselves apart from daily routines. So now ask yourself, if you're ready to distance yourself or pull yourself away from a daily routine to seek God or more of him, are you willing to set your alarm just a little bit earlier, even if by 30 minutes, to pray with God instead of immediately turning on the television in the morning or reading the newspaper or jumping on Facebook? Because now you must ask yourself, what are you feeding your soul before your day begins? Is it something of substance? <clears throat> that will get you through the day or put in a necessary burden of the world's cares on you? Or are you willing to cut your lunch time in half in order to be able to step into his presence and have a private moment to release all that you've already dealt with throughout the day so far? Are you willing to cut yourself off from your family when God calls you so that he can reveal some things to you, even though you feel like you might have been neglecting your family lately? Sometimes in order to fully experience God's presence in his glory, we have to do some extraordinary things that are out of the normal routine. This relates to a cycle. And remember, Ora just gave a powerful message about cycles. So what daily routines do you need to break out of so that God can break out into your life? So back to the act of washing, it was to prepare them to get their minds and hearts ready. When we meet God for worship, we should set aside everything. 
always use your physical time of preparation to get yourself prepared for the spiritual experience. So in Exodus 40, 30 through 32, and this was after the tabernacle was completed, next Moses placed the wash bin between the tabernacle and the altar. He filled it with water so the priests could wash themselves. Moses and Aaron and Aaron's sons used water from it to wash their hands and feet. Whenever they approached the altar and entered the tabernacle, they washed themselves just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So in the scripture, we see that there was a command given by God to Moses in regards to the cleansing ritual required by the priests. So that is because during the Old Testament, the priests had to make sure that they didn't just approach God in his presence in any old kind of way. They needed to rid themselves of the dirt of life, meaning anything that was not like God. This was necessary then, but I need for everyone to understand that even though we may not have a water basin outside of our door, the cleansing is still necessary today. Amen. So how many of us make sure that we cleanse away the lies that we told on someone throughout the day? Or that old fucky attitude that you just can't seem to shake? Or that bitterness that we discussed last week? That helping hand that we may have snatched back from a friend or even an enemy who truly needed us. And when pettiness cross came across, sorry, that pettiness when you cross your arms and pout because you couldn't get your own way. Or anything that's not like God. So are we really making sure that we aren't coming to God with our filth that has attached itself to us during the day and is causing a stench? We need to make sure that we smell good in his presence. How many of you want to smell good in his presence? I know I do. If we aren't, then God is not pleased. And many people miss this today because they're stuck in their traditions. And this is exactly what happened to the Pharisees on most occasions, if not all. In their aim to convince others of their goodness from the outside, they completely miss the one who could cause their goodness to shine from the inside. Amen. So let's examine the old versus the new system which Jesus was trying to convey to the Pharisees. The old system was temporary. The new system would be permanent. Aaron was the first high priest, but Jesus is the only high priest. The old system used the blood of animals. The new system would use the blood of Jesus. The old system needed perfect animals. The new system would need the perfect life, which was Jesus. The old system required careful approach towards the tabernacle, but the new system would encourage confident approach, which means that we are boldly able to come towards the throne. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees harshly, and not because he wanted to disavow the ritual of hand washing, but he needed for them to understand that he disapproved of their emphasis on the outward rather than the inward forms of religion. Amen. So on to verses 39 through 41, it says, Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones. He didn't, did, he, did not he who made the outside make the inside also, but rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. And so I like Jesus. Y'all, Jesus was cool. He would just go about doing his father's business and preach. He would heal and deliver people without a care in the world about people's thoughts of him. And so some of us need to take note of this. And I'm not saying that we should have a don't care attitude. I'm not saying that at all. Jesus just didn't allow the low murmurings or gasps of despair about his actions to faze him. And if we know that we are being led and doing the Father's work, we should realize that there are people who are bound to murmur and gasp at us as well. Now, by this time, I can imagine that Jesus was probably throwing down on the meal and actually threw a look towards everyone like, y'all not going to eat. I'm, I'm eating. I'm not going to eat. <laughs> Trust and believe that Jesus was well aware of the Pharisees' reaction and then spoke about the more important issues, which was purity. You Pharisees, he said, clean the exterior of the cup and the dish, but your interior is full of greed and wickedness. So now time to study a de definition for just a moment. Greed is defined as an intense and selfish desire for something, especially wealth and power. This isn't something that you simply desire to have like everyday necessities. This is an extreme because it simply says intense. So typically anyone who embodies greed will do anything in their power to have control of all things, have a say in all things, and no one, dare, no one dares to oppose them. So does that sound familiar? Because again, there are leaders who have gone down this road before clawing for more wealth by fooling their congregations or attempting to rule with an iron fist in an effort to gain absolute power. 
Jesus didn't say anything wrong. He called the Pharisees out and called their bluff. And there are plenty of scriptures that he could have used to further prove the downfall of greed. And so we'll review some right now just so that we understand. And Jesus may have been pointing it out to them during that time, but his word still stands true today. So in Proverbs 23 and 4, it states, Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. So it means that some of you are so busy trying to increase your wealth with the next get quick rich scheme or seeking financial advice from all sorts of advisors that you wear yourself out because you are putting all of your energy into amassing more wealth. God takes it a step further and even says, cease from your consideration of it. That word simply means stop. That means red light, stop sign, do not pass go, do not collect $200. So stop thinking about it because your mind is no longer focused on me. Remember what we said about the spiritual eye being focused. These things are clouding your vision and you can no longer see God. And in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 18, it states, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. And so this verse is so simple in its instructions. Those who are filled with greed are admonished to maintain their hope in God who richly supplies all of their needs, not on those things which may be here today and gone tomorrow. The material things that only bring us temporary happiness, but not God who gives us joy, especially when we come to lean and depend fully on him. This reminds me of the story where Jesus tells the young man to sell all of his possessions and give the money to the poor and follow him. So don't end up like the young man and leave Jesus' presence because you simply cannot let go of your grief. Don't miss out on a relationship with God because you are not ready to do good, be rich in good works, and ready to share your wealth. We must be careful because rationalizing not helping others is easy when we've already given our tithes and our offerings to the church. But a person who follows Jesus should share with those who are constantly in need. So while tithing is important to the life of the church, our compassion must not stop there. If we can help, we should help. So now back to the Pharisees, in view of their failure to be concerned about their inner moral condition, Jesus spoke to them as senseless and asked them, did not the one who made the exterior also make the interior? The Pharisees would have agreed that God is the creator of the whole person, including the innermost self. The, God, the godly motivated, excuse me, the godly motivated given in response to needs made the whole person clean. So it revealed the purity of the deep inner self, which could not be produced by means of ceremonial cleansing with water. Jesus advised them that they push themselves to great pains to keep everything clean that touched their food to avoid their bodies being defiled and eating. However, they didn't push themselves to great pains to keep their minds clean from pollutions that were far worse. Those pollutions like greed and wealth and power and wickedness. They love to think of themselves as clean, but their stinginess towards God and the poor proved that they were not as clean as they thought. So ask yourself, how are you using your resources that God has entrusted you with? And note that your generosity often reveals a lot about your purity of heart. And so the second point, they remember to give a tenth of even their garden herbs, but neglect the justice. So in verse 42, it says, But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and root and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. With their emphasis on external, minute tasks, the Pharisees made themselves guilty of failing to manifest the more important issues, which were justice and the love of God. As Jesus called to their attention, they were under obligation to practice justice and love. Compassionate care and concern for others should have been the discernible evidence of their love for God. And at the same time, they were not to be neglectful about tithing. The Mosaic law did include commands about tithing, and Jesus upheld that law when he added that those things should not be neglected or overlooked. So through the tradition of the elders, an extensive body of commands came into existence. And these commands went far beyond the requirements of the Mosaic law and often made it appear to be harsh and unreasonable. There were times when the commands of the traditions that men implemented interfered with what God commanded, which was being just, being compassionate, and showing love. 
So I'm going to repeat that part again because I think it's very important. It says that there were times when the commands of tradition that men implemented interfered with what God commanded, which was being just, being compassionate, and showing loving deeds. So the many traditional stipulations about what constituted work caused the Pharisees to consider loving and compassionate relief that Jesus often bought to the sick and afflicted on the Sabbath day as something evil when it was not. And so the third point, they love praise and attention, verses 43 through 45. And it reads, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces. This is the second time Jesus begins with woe to you, Pharisees. The term woe is an expression of grief. And this isn't his first time at the rodeo with the Pharisees, because as th at this point, you can imagine that Jesus is full of grief because he had to continuously call out the Pharisees in regards to their behavior. And so think about it. Anyone who has children can likely relate. This had to be as exhausting as telling a child the same thing multiple times and having to chastise the child for their wrongdoings. Mm -hmm. So let's all examine ourselves and make sure that God doesn't constantly have to call us out on our behavior. Before you do anything or make a move in your life, think about if God would be pleased or if he would just drop his head and say, woe well, unto you. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to bring him joy? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. So Jesus continued by rebuking them for their outward show. They loved the front seats in the synagogues, having others greet them in the marketplaces. And today we may relate this to sitting in the front row of the church or even being on the pulpit or on the stage. The front seats that the Pharisees craved faced the audience. They felt the need for everyone to see them. These were the seats of honor reserved for synagogue officials and notable guests. And it's apparent that they were pursuing the praise of men, and this was a dangerous place to be in, because the praise of men should be avoided. In Luke 6 and 26, it states, What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds, for their ancestors also praised false prophets. And as we have studied before, many false prophets lived during Old Testament times, and they were praised by the kings and the crowds because their predictions of prosperity and victories of war were exactly what the people wanted to hear. The thing is, popularity is no guarantee of the truth, and human flattery does not equal God's approval. Sadness lies ahead of those who chase after the crowd's praise rather than God's truth. The enemy would love to trap us in the sin of pride, something that is easily seen in others, but can be very difficult to see in ourselves. And we must find ways to counter the sin of pride by serving others in ways that are not seen by men. So ask yourself, do you feel less significant or less important if the spotlight isn't constantly on you? Do you feel as though no one cares if there is not a huge crowd present to see your works for the kingdom? We have to separate ourselves from these types of attitudes. Remember that your true character is that person you become when no one is watching. So wanting to be known for their godliness, the Pharisees desire to be seen occupying these seats of honor. And when passing through the marketplaces, they wanted to be greeted or respectfully acknowledged as pious men. So to put another pen right here, because this is something that hit me hard, and it's probably because I've seen this so many times growing up in the church. But can we as children of God just get past the place of feeling bitter or slighted just because someone didn't acknowledge us or show us the type of respect we thought was necessary? We as believers have, have been commanded to come together to worship, and in many instances, we do become like family, and family does speak to each other and acknowledge each other. But beyond that, we should remember that the church is not a social club. And so what if the person did not acknowledge you? Get over yourself, because you didn't take it upon yourself to approach that person and acknowledge him or her first, and possibly see if there was something wrong in the spirit. And it might be something that was regarding an incident that they had been going through at that very moment. So I implore you to move past those attitudes because this has caused many people to stop dealing with each other just because both had too much pride and it became petty. Communication is a two-way street. So let us not be like the Pharisees and believe that we are wrong when a person simply understands that above all, God should be acknowledged in all of our ways. So to wrap this scripture up, while the Pharisees were craving to appear holy in the sight of others, they did not reflect the loving and compassionate disposition and inner purity associated with true godliness. Wow. 
So going on to verses 44 and 45, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. Then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. The Old Testament law, law said, a person who touched the grave was unclean. And this can be found in Numbers 19 and 16, which stated that anyone who touched a grave would be ceremonially unclean for seven days. Jesus accused the Pharisees of making others unclean by their spiritual rottenness. Like unmarked graves hidden in a field, the Pharisees corrupted everyone who came in contact with them. When again pronouncing woe for them, Jesus likened the Pharisees to unidentifiable burial places over which people walk without even realizing it. The Pharisees were completely clueless, and many times they missed exactly what Jesus was saying to them. So let us not miss what he's saying to us today. All of the fronts that the Pharisees put on still did not qualify them to be identified with Jesus. Again, all of the fronts that they put on still did not qualify them to be identified with Jesus. Our title refers to the question of who do people say you are versus who you actually are. So we must be careful in what we do as well. Are people able to identify you as a child of God by the words that come out of your mouth? Are they able to identify you by the love that you show even when you're your you're enemies? Are they able to identify you by your actions and more importantly, your reactions to situations in life? Are they able to identify you not just when they see you on Sunday morning and for the Pharisees that would have been when they were in the temple, but can they identify you when you are out and about and may not even realize that they are watching? Are others able to identify you as a Christian? When comparing the Pharisees to unseen graves, Jesus exposed them as being seemingly clean on the outside, but internally impure. What they appear to be in the eyes of others can conceal their inner defilement. Remember that every one of us is influencing somebody else or others in some way. So ask yourself, will it be positive and pleasing to God? And so the fourth point, they loaded people down with burdensome religious demands. Verse 46 says, and he said, woe to you also lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear. And you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So these religious demands were the details that the Pharisees had added to God's law. He accused them of loading the people down with heavy burdens, but being unwilling to lift a finger to lighten their load. In Exodus 20 and 8, it states, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And as an example, the Pharisees had added instructions regarding how far a person could walk on the Sabbath, which kinds of knots could be tied, it's just ridiculous, and how much weight could be carried. Healing a person was considered unlawful work on the Sabbath, although rescuing a trapped animal was lawful. It's no wonder Jesus condemned their additions to the law because they had become so nitpicky that many people found it cumbersome to try to remember all of the traditions. As persons learned in the law, the scribes should have been concerned about conveying its true meaning and spirit to the people. Instead, they burdened them with many additional regulations that went far beyond what the law actually required. So although they must have been aware of the oppressive effect that many of the rules and regulations had on the people, they were unwilling to look at matters reasonably and humanely. As Jesus said, they refused to lift the finger to ease the burden doing nothing to eliminate unreasonable regulations. And so Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 through 30 states, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And a yoke was a wooden bar that joined two animals together as they plowed the fields. The yoke would keep one animal from getting too far ahead and it will also be a means of training a new animal by being yoked with an experienced animal. So when we become Christians, we are spiritually joined to Christ, but his burden is meant to be light, not a heavy thing. And the experts in the law had placed heavy burdens on the people and Christ came to give them rest. And so in closing, or you can play something soft. Let's examine again the reason for Jesus rebuking or Jesus's rebuke against the Pharisees. They washed their outsides, but not their insides. They remembered to give a tenth of even their garden herbs, but neglected justice. They loved praise and attention, 
and they loaded people down with burdensome religious demands. So you must take away the next thing that I'm about to say because this is probably the biggest issue that he had with the Pharisees. They took away the key of knowledge. They knew what the law said and should have been able to identify the promised Messiah because this is why Jesus wept and grieved at times because he was right there in front of them. He was right there with them. The Pharisees should have been the first to respond in faith and use their knowledge to promote faith amongst the people. Instead, they refused to impart the available knowledge that they had and deprive the people of what they needed to know. And so this would have allowed them to become part of the realm where God reigns by way of his son. And so in turn, because the Pharisees refused to enter that realm themselves, their actions and attitudes also prevented those who wanted to enter as well. So Jesus' words greatly angered the Pharisees, and in a spirit of hostility, we find that in the end, they questioned him about many things. Again, with the intent of trapping him into saying something they could use against him. The teachers of the religious law, the Pharisees, hoped to arrest Jesus for blasphemy or heresy or breaking the law. They were enraged by his words about them, but they couldn't arrest him for merely speaking words. And eventually we find that they had to find a legal way to get rid of Jesus. So finally, man-made traditions confuse and add to what God requires. God has a set of standards found in the Bible and they must be lived out in the lives of the believers. These standards are hard enough without adding to them. The Pharisees believed the lie that God sees as man sees. In other words, what they thought would impress God was what impressed everyone else around them. However, they were wrong. God sees what man does not see. And again, the question tonight is, who do people say you are versus who you really are? Amen.